Welcome back to the Toppy Blues, your source for all things Everton. My name is Connor Williams, joined by Patrick Boyland of The Athletic. Um, and today, it's mainly just a chat with you about uh, how the season's gone. Um, first of all, though, how are you? Good, good, yeah. Um, nice to have a bit of a break from the daily grind, the weekly grind of covering games. Um, but it doesn't ever really stop, as, you, as you'll know yourself, covering Everton. It, it kind of there's a steady stream of stories, takeover uncertainty, and everything else. So yeah, primed for a, a little bit of calm at the moment, but primed for a busy summer, I'd say. Yeah, I, I tend to find that the summers are the ones where some of the worst stuff tends to happen. Um, you know, managers leaving. I remember Carlo Angelotti a couple of summers ago was an absolute awful one to start with. Yeah. Um, you did mention how draining it's been, and overall, it has been very tough. Um, you know, for everyone at the club. From all the reporting throughout the season um, and sort of now, what was the sort of mood in the club? Was was the feeling in the club um, almost the same as the fans were feeling? Because I know from the outside looking in, it was a tough season. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody saw the extent, the magnitude of the first points deduction coming. I think, that, I think there was certainly a feeling that I got that they expected a slap on the wrist of some kind. But certainly not a 10 point deduction and probably not a deduction at all i mean the club the club was pushing for a transfer embargo or a form of financial penalty um so i think probably the first emotions that came through were shock and then anger over the club's treatment um and then it turns out i think then it shifts a little bit into defiance then it's well we're going to band it together and we're going to show everybody that kind of we're in this for the long haul we can we can overcome adversity whatever's put in front of us we can overcome adversity and we can we can get through this season but i think what started to happen as the season went on was that the setbacks just became so common you 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 get four points back from the first psr appeal and then you immediately get hit more or less within a month or so with another two points take over uncertainty creeping stories of potential administration. And I think it just became draining for everyone at the club and and, and certainly for us journalists as well covering it to just keep track of, of of what was going on. And like it felt like more or less every Monday there'd be a big negative news story that that broke. And I think that that did start to grind people down. What well, one of the things I found fascinating when we, we started to look at the the early impact of the the, the 10 point deduction was that a lot of people that had been in that situation before that we spoke to had, had mentioned that there's an initial resurgence, there's an initial feeling that you're going to thrive in the in the face of adversity. But after a while, you've just expended all your energy. And what, what comes then is, is is a bit of a trough. Um, and obviously, Everton had several of those throughout the season and um, it did start to take its toll. You've just got to give them credit for, for getting over the line, haven't you? I mean... Two points deductions worth eight points, and yet by the end of the season, Everton were comfortably safe. Um, and without the points deduction, would have been very, very close to a top half finish. So, given all the challenges that were put in front of them, I think that that's a pretty decent outcome. Yeah, I mean, I must admit, it feels weird saying that I'm pretty happy with how the season went, considering how it did go. But um, like you said, when you take away the points deductions, which you'd hope aren't going to become a regular thing for us. You got to think, you know, on the field. There's definitely progress made um, throughout the coaching staff. Um, obviously, the coaching staff, Deitch, Wone, and Steve Stone, uh, have worked incredibly hard um, since coming back in like early 2023. Um, you did an interview with Ian Wone uh, about how it was as a um, and it was a great piece and a nice insight into Sean Deitch and the relationship he had with him. What do you think of the main takeaways and learning points of this season have been for Sean Dyche? Because it has been tough for him um, and just shed a bit of light on him as a person as well. Because I think sometimes he's a bit um, boxed in by why the media's views of him. Yeah, I think that's, let, let's start with that final bit. I think that that's a fair point. You've got a public persona before you even meet the guy and that's the ginger shaved head, gruff voice, um, Obviously, did well with a limited budget at Burnley. Um, but he's very much put in the box. I think Dyche, everybody thinks they know the style of football he plays. And probably there's some inaccuracies in that insofar as, yes, he does play direct football. 
But I think quite a lot of people on the outside expect Everton to just have 10 men, 10 outfield players behind the ball every time. And and actually, some of my criticism this, this season was that if you look at, say, the Chelsea game, for argument's sake, or why Everton played far too high up the pitch and gave Chelsea far too much room in between the lines. So I think that there, that there's a bit of a disconnect between Sean Dyche's actual reality and what the outside world sees of him, if that makes sense. Um, he's an interesting guy to deal with. Obviously, he's um, what what comes through is kind of his innate confidence, even in the face of adversity. And where I felt really sorry for him this season is not having to be the very public persona, the very public face of Everton. And quite a lot of the things he was having to answer questions on were not in his wheelhouse. He's there to manage the team day in, day out. But he's not going to be a PSR expert. He's not going to be a takeover and acquisitions expert. Sometimes I think managers in England in particular are in this difficult situation of having to field all these questions because they're the only one that communicates kind of week in, week out with the with the fans through through the media. Um and, and look, yeah, I mean you mentioned Ian Wone there. They're a very tight knit staff. Wone and Daesh, as is mentioned in the piece, they live together at Burnley. They now live together in South Liverpool. Um, and Steve Stone's part of that group as well. And I, I, I think they are very, very confident in their methods. They believe that over the course of a 38-game season, there might be spells that are, are really quite high and spells that are really quite low. But they believe that if they keep doing what they set out to do and they, they stick by their methods, there will be enough there over a 38-game season to achieve their goals. And He's very consistent in that messaging. I'm, I'm sure that was probably a frustration to fans at time. Um, not much changed, even when there was that long barren run in the middle of the season from December on without wins. Very little change tactically, very little changes in terms of personnel. He perseveres with people maybe that supporters on the outside wouldn't have had in the team. Um, and then at the end of it all, he kind of comes back and says, well, Look at me. I, I look look at the outcome. I should say I, I, you should have had the faith in me. You should have got it right, and and so on and so forth. So I, I go back to the original point, which is I think he's, he's done a good job in very challenging circumstances, and and probably if we strip out everything else, probably what the club needed in this period, where there is such turmoil, whether there is such little financial certainty, and and there's, there's certainly not a big budget. Um, I think he's hard done to with regards to the manager of the year nominations. Because I look at I Iriola, for example, at Bournemouth, who's done a very good job, admittedly. But I think he's a fashionable name and, and plays a fashionable brand of football. Um, but he certainly didn't have all the things Daesh had to contend with this season. Um, and, and I think that's a greater achievement. So, so yeah, but the, the right incumbent for the here and now for, for Everton, I'd say. Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, I think he was a little bit hard done by there for the manager of the year. Um, obviously, we have sort of lost over the takeover. It was a big, big talking point this season, the takeover crisis, um, which I think tarnished the majority of the season since Fad Mishiri accepted the deal to sell to 777. Then we had, you know, Josh Wander and Steve Pascoe uh, and the other reps in the box at Goodison Park, which made it look like the deal was quite close to being done. Now, since then, the deal is now pretty much dead in the water. Um, can you tell us anything about the people you spoke to regarding that situation? Because um, it really didn't seem ever like um, they had the money, the takeover was ever going to be done once news reports and media outlets were reporting it. Um, but it seemed like from the outside looking in, Nishiri was defiant in wanting to sell to them. Yeah, I, I think he has been defiant in wanting to sell to them. And even recently, he gave them an extension until the end of March to, to complete that takeover. We'll all have our opinions on why he's done that. Um, and certainly, I, I can't get in Mashiri's head all the time and work out what makes him tick and why, why he's choosing to make decisions he does. All I can do is offer my own opinion, and and probably I would say that it must be the best deal for Farhad Mashiri with regards to receiving money for his shares. He's um even during that steady trickle of negative stories about Triple Seven throughout the season, he's always remained pretty steadfast. 
him and those close to him that they would complete the deal and that everything would would go as as planned. And I, I I go back to his statement in September when news of the deal was originally announced, and he, he described them as uh, something along the lines of the best, the best outcome for Everton, the best new owners for Everton. And I think in time, that's categorically proven not to be the case, hasn't it? Um, I, I take everything he says with a pinch of salt, to be honest. And then just from personal experience, we've all heard him on talks, but we've all heard him on Sky Sports. We've all heard him in interviews, even with official club channels or or club affi affiliates. Um, and I've not necessarily got faith in him looking at his hires at Everton and the, the course of his body of work at Everton. I've not necessarily got faith in him to choose the right people for Everton. Um, and, and and so it's proven. Um it's obviously a situation though that's unraveled quite quickly. I mean, some of the some of the stories about their time at Standard Liège and and, and the other clubs have, have obviously made headlines and, and rightly so. Lack of payments, transfer bans, all of that is concerning. But sometimes you need a big bomb to to really kind of spark something. I think obviously that was the fraud, the fraud proceedings that were brought against them in the in the US in a New York court. That that's the moment where you look at it and go, what well, this is this is really, really serious. And then you also say to yourself, well, how is a private equity firm that's currently being sued for fraud in the US going to find 160 million pounds to pay off MSP? Who's going to lend them that money? So and there's obviously there's obviously always been a concern and a doubt, always red flags as to whether they were going to be able to complete. But the speed with which it's unravelled, I think, has has been surprising even for me. Yeah, because it did seem like you said there was there was rumours um, and there was stuff like that, and then it seemed like just in the space of two weeks, everything they had imploded, and every like club they had a bit of a thing in just started to implode with them. Um, it was quite spectacular to see something um, crumble so quickly. Um, yeah, truly amazing to watch from the outside. Yeah, well, I, I think one of the law proceed one of the lawsuits spoke about a house of cards that was quickly starting to tumble, and it's a great description. It's probably one as a journalist you look at and think, "I wish I'd I'd been the one to write that for the first time." Um, but sometimes that's just the nature of the beast with these things. I mean, one thing leads to another and leads to another, and obviously now they're in a very different period. Triple seven, in so far as they've got creditors to pay off, restructuring experts looking at how those funds can be divested. Um, as we understand it, at least one of the clubs in their portfolio up, up for sale. And depending on who you speak to, most of the clubs in their portfolio up, up for sale if the, if the right offer comes in. Um, and you've got a situation where. While well, Josh Wander and Stephen Pascoe remain the co-founders of Triple Seven, they're not currently on the board of directors. That they, they've been removed by the by the restructuring experts. So, like I say, it has started to unravel, and I think almost for the last couple of weeks, maybe the last month or two, for us in our heads, it's been a question of, well, if this doesn't happen, what next? What what else? What else is on the table? Who could come in? Um, what does the situation look like if nobody comes in in the immediate term, given that Triple Seven were funding the club? Some of these questions we don't know the answer to, of course. Um, we'll have to wait and see how it all plays out. Um, but in the short term, we've got that 31st date, which looms large for, for, for them to complete. And uh, I don't think anybody really expects them to do so, but I don't know. Strange, strange things have happened and we've been surprised at many stages along the way well it's interesting you mentioned what's next because that's literally my question obviously we've still got MSP uh, around and George Down and Andy Bell are still in the mix um, and you know I was just going to ask you about their situation but also um, as of like what two weeks ago last week um, which you guys have done an interview with on the Athletic um, with Matt Woosman there is Crystal Palace co-owner John Texter as well, who's gone out and very, very boldly claimed his uh, stake in wanting to buy uh, buy into Everton. So just shed some light on the, that situation and MSP because they're still floating around quite a bit. Yeah, I think the first thing to say is that the club's existing creditors 
like MSP and like rights and media funding, obviously going to have to have a big say in what comes next. Rights and media funding, as we've reported before, were effectively ones that torpedoed the initial MSP deal, more or less at this stage last season, if if, if you remember. Um, had they known what was going to come after that, maybe they'd have t- taken a different stance, I don't know. Um, but they're very important as creditors, partic- particularly right to media funding with that right to veto. Um, MSP in a different way, obviously, they could already own 51% of the club right now. Had they not on, I think it was April the 15th, the, the night of the Chelsea game, had they not agreed to extend the repayment deadline for their loan. Um, so these figures are all in the background and are all part of the equation, I think, as, as, as far as what comes next is concerned. You're right, I think, to highlight Andy Bell and George Downing. Most people will know the names, but obviously two prominent Evertonians who were were part of that wider MSP investment group. Um, I think they're going to be important in all of this as well in terms of finding solutions. Um, They are obviously owed money as part of that MSP package. Um, And Andy Bell's Blythe Capital provided security on on, on one of the loans given to the club. So um, I I think these are good people to have around the the picture. They, they, They care about the club. As Evertonians, they they're prominent at games. I think I tweeted about George Downing being at a game the other week, and it, it it got quite a bit of attention. But he is at games pretty regularly, even though he lives abroad. He's he's an Everton Evertonian. He has a a season ticket in one of the lounges. Andy Bell, pretty similar situation. Um, that there is going to be interest in Everton. I, I think the 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 problem they might have is that there are an awful lot of people that need a slice of the pie when it comes to existing creditors. I mean, let's say for argument's sake, Mashiri wants to write off his share shareholder loans of around 500 million. You've still got 200 million potentially in unsecured debt, junior debt to 777. You've still got 160 million to MSP. And then you've still got others... Um, right to media funding and a a very, very small loan from Metro Bank, I believe. Um, There's lots of people need to be paid and then you've got to guarantee the rest of the stadium project as well and the the funding of a club. So it's a huge package when you put it all together. Um, It's going to take somebody with deep pockets. I think John Texter probably does have those kinds of deep pockets. But his issue is that as of right now, he's still a part owner of Crystal Palace. So he can talk about liking the idea of buying Everton. Um, I wasn't actually in the interview he did with Matt that went out exclusively on the on the site. Um, but looking at his comments and getting a bit of extra context from, from what took place, he does have quite decent knowledge of where Everton are at in terms of some of the things I outlined to you there on on creditors and everything else. Um he says, and he says at one point that he, he he wonders whether the club is still going to be on the market by the time he's out of Crystal Palace, and I think that's a pertinent question. Um, but certainly, he's somebody that has explored the situation around the club, uh, and as far as I'm concerned, there will be others too. Well, that's good. It's good to know um, that while you know, obviously, he's like you said, he is tied up with Crystal Palace at the minute. There are other options that the club could look at because, like you said, it is a lot of money owed to a lot of different people. Um, and the big one being as well, the stadium needs to be finished. Uh, yeah. Obviously, all of this, um, fans will hear all of this and immediately worry about PSR issues once again. Um, do you know where the clubs stand uh, as of PSR issues next season? Do we have to sell? Uh, players before the deadline. I know there's a rumor that we have to sell one of our assets before. I think it's June. Possibly, I saw yeah. before. Yeah, I, I think PSR is always quite a complicated one to get to grips with because people think about profit and transfer fees, but what actually is really important is a player's book value over the length of their contract, and then what you sell for above that. To, to, and the, and the margin there is, is your I, I suppose what you call PSR profit per player. Um, what we do know quite helpfully was 
due to the independent commissions, we do know that Everton can only lose 38 million in PSR terms for 23, 24 to, if, if they want to remain compliant anymore, they go over that amount. They've breached again for, for a third successive year. Obviously you're allowed deductions. So it's not a simple case of they can't afford to lose 38 million. You can strip out loads of what they call good costs, which you'll have heard before things like um, infrastructure spending, academy and women's teams, community project, all that kind of stuff that that can all come out of your PSR calculation. Um, but Everton's trend went in the wrong way in 22 23 which is which is why they breached again they i think they they lost above 60 million in a PSR sense for for 22 23 so they're going to have to bring that down again what you have to remember is that they've made sales Tom Cannon should be included i think in the next PSR calculation Alex Awobi Damari Gray and all of those will be decent PSR profit from an Everton point of view um, particularly Cannon is an academy grad, particularly Damari Gray, because he only cost, I think it was 1.7 million when he joined from Leverkusen. Um, but I think there's work to do. I think I think there's work to do. They lost so much money last time around and they continue to accrue so much money in terms of interest payments on some of the loans they're taking out that they're going to have to make sure that they're very careful. And I think it is a case of trying to do business before June the 30th, like with many clubs in a bid to stay on the, on the right side of the line. Uh, when when you put this to the club, I think it is only fair to include a, a club perspective on this, a right to reply. When you put this to the club, they, they say they're fa fairly calm about their PSR situation and their financial situation as a whole. Um, so that's their, that's their right to reply. And obviously people have their own opinions on that as well. Um, but I think it's going to be interesting because what we will have, not just with Everton, but around the league, is a situation where people are trying to sell by June the 30th. And you, clubs like Leicester off the top of my head. And I'm, I'm, Leeds financially, I think, will we'll be looking to make sales. Uh, there'll be loads of clubs in that situation um, and trying to make sure they stay on the right side of the line. And this time you've got the added compl complication of although the window opens in the middle of June, you've got a European Championship starting around the same time as well. So, I mean, from Everton's side, they might have Amadou Onana away with Belgium during this period. You might have Jared Branthwaite if he's selected for the final England squad um, and various others, Mikolenko. Um, so will clubs push, for example, for, a, for an extension to that deadline? Is that even possible? Um, I, I don't think it is, but it, it, it is mitigation of some, some form. So... Let, let's see how it goes. I, I, I certainly don't think in any sense Everton are able, whether it's PSR or just cash flow in general, I don't think Everton are able to just take a lump sum and throw it at a player. It's much more likely, as Kevin Thelwell said, that they, they are going to need to sell to safeguard the, the short, medium and long-term future of the club. Yeah, I was going to say Thelwell's um, statement, um, I think was needed, I think needed uh, and a good yeah. precursor for the fan base um, <clears throat> into the summer. Although I think many have sort of seen this summer as probably loans and free agents once again, um, which isn't the end of the world. There is bar there's been proven bargains to be found in there. Um, you mentioned two of the big players though in Bramthwaite and in Onana, and it's fair to say I think those two and then Bar Jordan Pitford, those two are probably our biggest best assets. Um, mm. Certainly selling wise because of their age, they're a fantastic asset to have and potentially sell. I wondered if you'd heard any more potential interest on both of them. I know Bramthwaite has been linked with Manchester United. Uh, as of this week, it's come out and said that um, Jim Ratcliffe isn't happy with Everton's valuation of him. Um, I just thought, yeah, that if you had any more light on those two. I, thought I find those stories quite funny. I mean, I, I, it's from a different publication, so I've no idea how it's been sourced and, and how accurate. But the idea that another club owner is is unhappy with Everton's valuation. I mean, well, that, that's kind of tough, isn't it, really? Um, what I do know is that, I mean, there's been a lot of talk around a 40 to £45 million pound price tag for Branthwaite, at least from rival clubs. When, when City and Manchester United were linked, the talk was of 40 to £45 million pound bids. I think everybody I speak to, and just for myself, that seems extremely low, given how precious a commodity he is. 
and the season he's just had. I mean, I think you've got a 21-year-old there who ticks every box you want from a modern centre-back. He plays on the left side of the defence. He plays out with his left foot, but he can also play with his right foot um, to the point where sometimes people wonder what's his strongest foot. Um, six foot four, but quick across the ground. Basically everything you want. You can carry the ball into defence, is aggressive, wins his aerial duels, all that kind of stuff. So that price tag seems particularly low. And look, maybe Everton's financial predicament will be such that, again, clubs try and lowball for, for players like Branthwaite. But I don't think he's ever going to be short of suitors, given how well he's done. And probably the same for, for Onana. And I know Onana splits opinion a little bit more amongst the fan base. Um, but there are some big clubs following him, and there have been for quite a long time. Truth, truth be told, not just in this country, abroad as well. And um, I think he's slightly different to Branthwaite in the sense that I think if you took Branthwaite out of Everton's team now, there's a huge drop-off to what, what comes next. And you might be able to plug a gap, but are you going to be able to find somebody as good as Jared Branthwaite in the market, given your financial constraints? Onana is clearly very talented as well, but he's obviously been less in favour with Dice throughout the season. He's come in and out of the side. Um, and I think he's more of a possession player, really. I, I, I think he'd, he'd, he'd show more in a side that wants to dominate and wants to have loads of the ball. Um, it doesn't strike me as an obvious fit for this version of Everton right now. So I, I think if if I think if they were losing one, it would be easier to cope with Onana going right now for this current team. Um, and I think he is the one they would probably prefer to sell as well for that for that very reason. Um, but it would be sad to lose either of them. Uh, I think they're both ex extremely talented, and ideally, if you're in a different financial predicament, you build around both, don't you? And you just go, this is our really strong core. We've got Pickford, Tarkovsky, Branthwaite, Onana, Idris Agay, the core eight, and you build from there. And that's a pretty decent base, I think, from which to start. Where Everton have obviously let themselves down this season, as in other parts of the pitch, it's in, I'd say, a lack of flair, a lack of creativity, at times a lack of depth at fullback, and, and obviously a lack of finishing prowess as well. Um so there's a lot to do anyway. You, you don't want to strip away so much that you've, you're going to leave even more for, for next season. I think that that that's maybe my concern, that if you lose one or two players on top of the one you've already lost, then you're leaving yourselves with, with an awful lot to do before the start of next season. Yeah, well, you mentioned attacking um, and finishing prowess. And one of the players I do have on my list to mention to you is Dominic Calvert-Lewin because his contract situation, he's obviously about to enter next season will be his final year, which then leaves the club in a situation of either re-sign or sell, ideally this summer, because um, January, you know, he's free to go on a free uh, or to be uh, spoken to. Do you have... Any idea what the club are planning there? There's been rumours all all uh, week, but they are fan. I think they're fan rumours. A lot of them. Um, I just wondered if you had anything on Dominic Calvert Lewin. Um, obviously from the outside looking in, the club admire him, but it takes more than admiration to sign a contract, doesn't it? Money talks. Yeah, I, I think you're referring if you if you're talking about the messages. I think you're referring to the ones you know where it says forwarded many times on. On WhatsApp and this the the story about Newcastle and June yeah. for all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I have seen that. Um, I didn't really place that much stock in it, other than to say that I think we've previously reported on our site over the last two or three years that Newcastle have followed and scouts at Newcastle like Dominic Calvert Lewin. There's obviously an issue with his contract, as you point out as well. Um, a year left to run now. Same with. Ben Godfrey, same with Michael Keane, Mason Holgate and Lewis Dobbin, amongst others. There's more, but some of them off the top of my head. Um, I think Everton ideally would want to keep Calvert-Lewin. Uh, we've certainly reported before that they were they were, were keen to start talks over a new deal. And I think that was put on the back burner a little bit as the financial uncertainty continued and as Everton fought to stay in the Premier League. Um, the immediate priority from my sense was just, I think, Everton getting Idrissa Gay's contract extension over the line, sorting out the players who were out of contract this summer. Who do they want to keep and go? And I think now it's probably 
in this period. It's about do we keep Dominic? What happens if he doesn't sign his deal? Do we keep Ben Godfrey? What happens if he doesn't sign his deal? And so on and so forth. Um, so that's a again, and we, we speak about fluid situations. That's a fluid situation. They'll have to sit down and have talks and and see where it leads. And um, if he was to turn down a contract for argument's sake, then that leaves Everton in a position where they either sell now or lose them for free potentially in six to twelve months' time. So um, we're, we're, I think we need clarity on that sooner, sooner rather than later. Um, and I think we did start to see a bit of the Dominic Calvert-Lewin of old in the final month or two of the season. He'd obviously had that bad bad patch where he went a long time with without scoring and his contract was eroded. But the final months of the season, I mean, that performance against Liverpool was brilliant. Um, started to score goals again, started to lead the line. I thought he was great at Arsenal, even though he didn't score on, on the final day of the season. And a fit firing Calvert-Lewin is obviously a, a huge asset for Everton and 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 one that other clubs will take a look at as well. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. I think I think it'll be his his situation is an interesting one and one that requires a a, a pretty speedy resolution. Yeah, I, I, it's um, interesting as well. You said about the fit firing. I, I was looking the other day at his um, stats for the season, um, and it has to be said, fair play to him, Sean Dyche, and the staff because he's gone from. 18 games in the first, in one season, 18 games last season to 38 this season, which is, you know, incredible. 20 games more. Um, that that serves credit to everyone who's taken part in helping him get there. Yeah, massively. And some of that is Sean Dyche, just giving a player a little bit longer to get back to 100% fitness. I think maybe where some of his predecessors slipped up in the past was in knowing Calvert-Lewin's importance to the team. And then as soon as he was anywhere near fit, thrown him back into the firing line. And when that happens, you obviously increase the, the risk of a of a re-injury or a, or a setback of some kind. And Dice has just said, well, I know what he looks like when he's fit. I know what his numbers look like in training and in matches when he's fully fit. And until he hits those numbers, he's not getting in that team. Um, and he's played better. He's played Schmitty at times. Um, and he's taken Calvert-Lewin out of the firing firing line, I think, on occasions and when, when he hasn't been fully fit. Um, so it's the best. But it's comfortably the best run of games for Calvert-Lewin in the season since before his injury injury problems, really. And I, th- I think towards the end of the campaign, we finally, like I say, started to see the Calvert-Lewin of old. That was the thing, I think, that held, that held clubs back from going for him. A year or two ago, it was always can Calvert Lewin stay fit, and I think the the, the big question now for for Calvert Lewin is whether he wants certainty. He's got a year left on his contract. Does he want a a big contract where he puts down roots and he he tries to kick on now now that he's back, he's back to fitness, um, or does he want to risk that maybe by going somewhere else? So. Um, it's going to be interesting to see it. That, that that's partly up to him. It's partly out of the club's hands. Does he want to sign a new contract? I suppose is the question. Um, I imagine, not to put too fine a point on it, that one of the issues for players at the moment, looking at the situation at the club, not just players at the club, but probably players elsewhere as well, is that they'll be seeing all these negative stories and they'll be looking at it and thinking, well, are they going to be in administration? For example, looking at some of the headlines, are they going to have money to pay me next month? All these kinds of things. I don't think those headlines help in in so far as signing new play signing new players or agreeing contracts is concerned. So to go back to the takeover situation, the sooner that is sorted and the sooner players at the club can feel that sense of stability, I think that the better too. You mentioned the incomings. Um, just quickly. Um... I wonder if you had any more on sort of the rumours. Obviously, we've seen the Trey Adams interest hasn't died down since last year. Wilfred and Diddy, I think we're quite, uh, we're in the race. Spine was the headline the other day. And then obviously Calvin Phillips and Jack Harrison, who leads aren't now getting promoted. So maybe makes him more accessible for another season long loan. Yeah, so... Jack Harrison is available again for for another season season long loan, as we understand it. Um, that would be a free loan with regards to a, a transfer fee. 
Um, but with Everton picking up full coverage of his wages if they want to progress with that deal. They are quite considerable, actually, because he signed a new deal not long before he left Leeds and at the end of the the, the summer they got the season they got relegated. Um so they they are quite considerable those wages. But Harrison's a player they like. I think Kevin Fellwell's on record saying, well even a month or so ago was on record saying that they were keen to explore a permanent or a loan for him. Um keen to engage in talks when when Leeds' own kind of future beyond this season was was a bit more known. Um so that's one they'll look at. The Calvin Phillips interest, I think, is genuine, although not particularly progressed at this stage. Um, you spoke about the loan markets and the free agent market there, and I mean he's somebody that that, that ticks a box in that sense, and in 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 the sense that he's out of the picture at Manchester City. I think highly, highly unlikely to get in under Pep Guardiola. Had a disappointing loan at West Ham, all things considered. And is now probably going to have to go somewhere and look to kick on again to revitalise what a, a, what it was a promising but stalled career. Um, I think I think Everton and Dyche would back themselves to turn Phillips around to to get him fit, which is obviously one of Dyche's key principles. Get him fit, get him a pre season, and all those kinds of things. And the issue is going to be that you look at the deal that West Ham agreed in January, and Huge wages, kind of hundred and fifty ish, I think, reportedly, um, and City wanted a big loan fee as well. well if, if 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 you go back to the point about Everton not being able to put down substantial chunks of money, then are they going to be able to do that? So that there's going to be interest in Calvin Phillips, and I'm sure Everton are interested, and I'm sure Everton are exploring that deal. Um, I think that gives you a sense as well of their priorities with regards to needing central midfield additions. Andre Gomez has left. Andre Amadou Onana might leave. There's obviously an issue on the wings as well with Dwight McNeil and Lewis Dobbin, the only out-and-out wingers now at the club after Harrison and Dan Gima's loans expired. Um, so they're going to have to progress in both of those areas. They're going to have to move in both of those areas. And I think those two players, Harrison and Phillips, are seen as, I suppose, potential options hopefully with minimal cost. Um, although the, the the Phillips one might be a difficult deal to do um, to help the team. Um, what, who was the other name you gave me? Uh, Wilfred and Diddy, who's Wilfred free and agent. Diddy, and, and Diddy in the same box, I guess. Free agent, likely to leave Leicester, I think. Um, we've seen reports, quite heavy reports from France over, over Leon's potential interest. I wouldn't necessarily say looking at it right here, right now, that Everton are in the, the box seat for him. But I think it would be a little bit bizarre if they weren't at least asking a question, given his status, his CV, Everton's positional needs and, and his availability. Um, so I wouldn't say I'm necessarily expecting him to be at Goodison Park, but again, stranger things have happened. Brilliant. Uh, that is all I've got time for, mate. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure nice. to speak to you as always. Nice one. Thanks for having me on. Don't forget, guys, you can like the video, subscribe to the channel if you're not already, and comment your thoughts down below. And you can check out Paddy and all the brilliant people at The Athletic as well. Go check them out. Uh, they cover every team in the Premier League and do a really good job. So check them out and stay safe.